discuss is uh, some additional uh, comments on, on levels of testing. I'm, you know, I could stand up here all day and talk about taxonomies for testing. I could stand up here all week. I could stand up here all month. I'm not sure anyone would be left at the end. Um, but these are some extremely useful things you'll want to think about when you're testing your program. Okay, first, number one, is the program compiling? Normally we don't think of that, uh, when, when testing is talked about in professional software development organizations, we don't immediately think about compilation. But when we so build our program, compile it, it can alert us to a number of types of problems. Give me an example of a sort of problem that can be identified when we compile a program. First of all, what does it mean to compile a program? Yeah. Okay, so we take our so-called source code, we take the code that we have written in a so-called high-level language, C, Java, Python, Ruby, you know, pick your language. And we turn it into a form that's we call executable, that the program connects the, 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 the uh, machine, the um, computer can actually run. In and of itself, for many languages, you can't just run the source code. Instead, we need to turn it into a form that can be run directly. And during that process, there's a lot of errors that can be found. Give me an example of an error that can be found there. Okay, a syntax error. Yes. Um, I had a friend who did um, uh, tutoring during her high school. She did uh, tutoring and computer programming. And uh, she worked with uh, a kid who was learning a computer program. And he complained bitterly to her about what he called the stink axe errors that he would get when he, when he was trying to run his program. Um, you know, you know those stink axe things were um, causing lots of problems. Well, what he meant, of course, was a syntax error. What do I mean by a syntax error? Yeah, yeah, so it's, it's a problem in how we phrase the program. It's kind of like a grammatical mistake in, in English or another natural language. It's, we've, we've given something that's not well formed. It's not phrased properly. So, you know, I can make an utterance to you, and uh, you can tell me, you know, uh, is, that, is that a legitimate, English sentence. Mm -hmm. um, that's only what syntax is checking. Syntax phase is checking. Is this a legitimate sentence? Putting aside the issue whether or not it's true. So it goes through a syntax checking phase, and you'll get syntax errors. And often it's occurring with something like you've missed an operator. So you meant to do you know, A plus B, you just by accident wrote A. Um, or you're missing a curly bracket at the end of a function um, would be another thing. You're missing a comma between the so-called formal parameters of a, of a function. Um, you are missing a semicolon. These are all syntax errors. And it's basically saying, like, I have no clue what you are telling me. You know, you are saying something that I don't understand in the sense of it's not a... It's not a legal s sentence. I, I don't know what you mean by that. Um, you're trying to phrase something to me, and that phrase is incomprehensible. So the syntax errors. Those are caught in a big way here in compilation. So another type of, type of error is called semantic errors. What do I mean by semantic errors? What do I mean by something? We, we talk about semantics crudely. What are we talking about? Yeah, the meaning of it. This goes beyond the phrasing, ladies and gentlemen. This is, what, again, like I could say, I came of Canada, or something like that. So that. That's something that grammatically doesn't make sense. What about the king of Canada? That, that you, am I saying that I am the king of Canada, or I'm saying I love the king of Canada? You know, um, what I've said is not. It, it, it doesn't, it's not a legal utterance in terms of kind of, uh, or legal sentence in, in, uh, in English. That would be a syntax error. 
a semantic error would be like, you know, I say, I say, well, I gotta be careful here. Uh, so, uh, yeah, well, if I said, I am the king of Canada, uh, you yeah, know, I would hope that you folks would rush up with crowns, you know, up for me, and instead you'd say, uh, say, what? Um, or, you know, uh, oh, come on. Uh, you know, what, what I'm saying there is false. It's, there's semantically, it's, um, it's not true. But I could also say, I could also say something that's actually a sentence. Semantically, it's nonsensical, but syntactically, it's fine. Um, uh, so, uh, you know, there's, uh, I think, Milton Chomsky, uh, famous, uh, arguably the most important linguist that's ever lived. He has this beautiful sentence, and I'm trying to remember what it is. It's like, uh, um, uh, loud, green ideas sleep furiously, or something like that. So I could say that. Is that legal English? Is that legal English grammatical? Yeah, it's wrong grammatical. Um, loud, green ideas sleep furiously. Is it sensible? Do, do ideas sleep? Are they loud? Are they furious? Um, no, that, that's, that's an indication of a semantic error. Give me an indication of a semantic error in a program. Divide by zero? Okay, yeah. yeah. Divide by zero would be, would be arguably something that's manifestly divided by zero would be something that's, um, that's a semantic error. Um, that's a little bit harder to detect because there may be a value of no, Maybe it's 1 over A, and A is computed by calling off to something that you know, reads something from the network. And so we don't know if it's going to be 0 or not. So that's a little bit of a, of a borderline one. But if it's manifestly in the code, yeah, then it will say, you're saying something that doesn't make sense here. Go, go figure. Go back and fix it. Um, that's what it's really telling. That's what the compiler is telling, even though it may not say it in voice. Um, so, what else is a semantic error? Uh, wouldn't it be like if you tried to assign mm -hmm. like uh, a class to an integer variable? Good. Good. Exactly. Exactly. So maybe an int, I assign it a you know a struct in C, or I assign it a uh, a function pointer, or I assign it a um, I assign it a, uh, you know, a value that's a string or something like that. Um, that would be something that semantically doesn't make sense. It's like, I don't know what you mean. I don't know what the meaning of that is. And this is the second class of things are caught. Now, I will tell you this, folks. And at, at a certain point when you're compiling your program, the syntax errors are detected first, and then the semantic errors. Okay. So. Um, when you're considering a little fragment of code, um, and often for the whole program is all of sort of checking the syntax first. And once you get past the syntax, then it will go in and check the syntax. Okay. We'll check. So this would be something like, um, yeah, it's, it's a good example. So we're assigning, you know, uh, a, a class, something that refers to a class to an int, um, or something, uh, something that's, um, you know, uh, Character or assign to a, a function pointer or something like that. Um, it's just like, uh, I don't know what makes sense of that. You're saying nonsense. You're spewing nonsense. These are a second set of things that are caught here. Um, and there's actually a third set of things, which are sort of warnings, um, uh, warnings of uh, likely um, of risky practices. Put it this way. Um, uh, so risky uh, practices, which which could well be semantically meaningless, um, but it's just not sure. <laughs> so, for example, we might have a variable, um, you know, uh, int a, and then we have some if statement, some complex condition. We don't know whether it's true or not. And here, a gets initialized. Um, there's no else, and then we use a down here. Now, 
A compiler can't tell us for sure that this, there's a problem. Why not? Why could this code be in principle legit? It doesn't know the if statement. Yeah, I mean, maybe we set it up so that, you know, we're, we're saying something very complex but true always, you know, and saying, you know, the 103rd Fibonacci number is whatever. And, and it turns out that's true, but it can't really check it. There's no way it can feasibly check it. Um, or it's saying, you know, the temperature current has to be less than 200 degrees something, or something like that. And it happens to be true, uh, but it can't, it, it doesn't have the wherewithal to sort of verify. So it can't say for sure that this is a problem, but hey folks, that smells a lot like a problem. And so it, it's going to probably give you a warning and say, possible use of an uninitialized variable. Um, even though you, and you go and you may look at this and say, what? Well, you know, here's the assignment. But the point is, if this is not true, then A will not be initialized. A will be left uninitialized. And then we're saying increment A. And if A hasn't been initialized, it may have some value, but you have no clue what it is. You have no guarantees to what that value is. And this code might not behave the same on different machines or different, different contexts. And you'll have a program which might work just fine as long as you're writing and running it on your desktop and you give it to the customer and it blows up. Bad luck. Bad luck. So, so compilers will often warn us about risky practices as well. And it's worth listening to that. Um, um, occasionally you'll say, well, it's not what I'm talking about, what I'm doing, I'm going to just ignore it. But, but often it's, Good practice to try to fix these things. Okay, so compilers are a key tool for us in testing. But do they get us where we want to go? Do they get us all the way to bug-free code? No. And folks, uh, this is this is the type of point where in computer science education, where I'm sorely tempted to jump up and down and and you know uh, exhort you. <laughs> To not make a mistake and think that once the compile, the program compiles that the good things are fine. In fact, there is no logical way it can be shown, and I'm trying to essentially demonstrate, there's no possible way we can determine, looking at a program, whether it is correct without, without running. You can't even determine without halts without running. That's not logically possible. You can't, you folks can be, you know, a class of Einstein. Your hair doesn't need to look like it, but you can be a class of Einstein sitting there. Um, and you could go off and you could work each for a hundred years to build the world's smartest compiler to figure out if the program halts or not. Not gonna work. Can't do it. Cannot do it, okay, logically. And later in your computer science education, hopefully you will see why that is. But for now, just be aware that that this is what the compiler checks is a bunch of sort of um, basic stuff. But when it compiles and it gives you your program back, you're going to get something that could be riddled with other mistakes. It doesn't do anything like what the user wanted it to do. And it may make lots of mistakes so it doesn't even do what you wanted it to do. Putting aside for the moment whether that's what the user wants it to do. Um, so, you know, another level of testing that you want to focus on is a situation where you're, you're running the program and it doesn't crash. Now, this, now, if, if, it, if the program doesn't crash, does that mean it's a, it's a, it's a working program? Does that mean that it's correct? No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. From some student responses, uh, from some fine third year students, you might sometimes think it does. Indeed, that's what the three thumb, three thumbs or toes up were. Um, it, it didn't crack. Okay, the, the program didn't crack. You just told the told the testing system you can't log in, buddy. Um, you, you can't get in a chat. You know, can't even get to one page of it. Um, that's all it did. So, so the fact that it does crack does not mean it's correct. And please don't assume that it does. You, I know it sounds so obvious, but student after student will fall into the thing of saying, well, the program works. What, what do you mean by works? Well, it, it runs. 
Okay, it's a long distance from this work. Correct. Does it handle incorrect and properly? Okay, um, so another level of testing it might be we have no graphical input, but we have some trivial input. We have some very simple input. Ladies and gentlemen, this is often where students stop. Why? Because they're, they're undergoing sympathetic testing. They're testing the program, hoping it works, you know, giving it nice slow ball, getting it ready to, to deliver um, in very, very nice, simple conditions, and it's like victory and you know, go. <laughs> Students sometimes get away with that in classes. But once you get out of here and you go into to jobs, which require you to use computers, even if they're not in the computer industry, even if they're not even in IT, even if it's just incidental use of computer, this, this is very dangerous. Because a lot of input probably won't be trivial. And your program may have huge gaps in where, it, where it's working. And you'll never know. Ignorance is dangerous. We want to know something about if there are problems, and we want to know it as soon as possible. As soon as possible, because it will allow us to fix it as soon as possible. Okay, so another level. You know, you provide reasonable expected input, um, a variety of reasonable expected input, um, common cases, that sort of stuff. And we'll talk about some ways of picking that that are that are um, will guide you to some more important cases, cases that are more likely to. Um, uh, to, to cause problems. So you might you might call these difficult to input. Things that are that are asking for trouble. Give me an example. So suppose I had a square root of function. Give me an example of something that might be an easy trivial input. Okay, one, four, good. Um, give me something that might be difficult to input. Okay, so with uh, points of uh, long decimal points, for example, in it. Okay, good. So we want to make sure it works for non-perfect squares, that sort of thing. Okay, how about, how about something else that would be difficult? Okay, so so zero would be an interesting boundary case, but these are still legitimate. How about illegal input? Well, it depends how it's defined, and I've been deliberately vague on this. If it's defined so that you're not allowed to give it negative values, then this is where you give it negative values. If you define it so that negative values are allowed, you might do those in the difficulty. Depends how you define it. And you start to get a sense here that defining what your program is supposed to do, what, what is legitimate input, what's <laughs> illegal input, is actually pretty darn important, even if you only communicate it informally. And then sort of all, all possible. Okay, so these are sort of different um, different levels of of testing. Okay, so where? Oh man. Um.